الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا وبعد Then the first thing before entering into the lesson for today is that anything outside of a general lecture and even a general lecture, any that's just a general admonition, it's always advisable to take notes, to have a pen and paper, to have a notebook where you retain benefit. And although we have a resource that you can read from directly here, there's always benefit that is shared by a teacher. Even if you have the book in front of you that you would not find in the resource, that is not found in the resource. And according to the receptiveness of those who are sitting in a lesson, or a lack thereof, and the enthusiasm and enthusiasm and the lack thereof is the likelihood that a teacher will share a benefit. And this is something that our scholars have taught us. And to be focused and to come with pen and paper to write benefits and so on and so forth. And this is out of respect for knowledge itself, for the religion itself. So we continue today, bi ta'ana with an explanation of the seven conditions of La ilaha illallah. The seven conditions of La ilaha illallah, of kalimat al-ikhlas, the statement of sincerity, the statement of monotheism, the statement that nothing has a right to be worshipped as a deity other than Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. Nothing has a right to be worshipped as a deity except for Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala, all of Islam is built upon this statement. All of Islam is built upon this statement. For this statement, tanfa'u qa'ilaha, to benefit the person who utters it, they must meet this description. They must meet this description. We mentioned in previous lessons in the broadcast that the conditions of la ilaha illallah are called by different names by the scholars, but they are all going in the same direction. Sometimes they are called the haqiqa of la ilaha illallah, the reality of la ilaha illallah, meaning it's the fat that here, it's essential attributes, the essential descriptions of the shahada. Sometimes they are called the furud, the obligations of la ilaha illallah, Sometimes they are called the usul or the asl of la ilaha illallah. The core and the fundamentals of la ilaha illallah. Whatever we call them, then we are referring to the same thing, which are the essential descriptions that must be there for the validity of a person's utterance of the shahada. So that when he dies and the angels come to him, at the time of his death, and they question him in his grave, then they will say, mitta, that you have died upon certainty. Kunta wa alayhi mitta wa alayhi tubathu, insha'Allah, as comes in a hadith. As you lived your life upon certainty, now you have died upon certainty. And so what is going to happen to you is certain. You can have certainty about what is going to happen to you, meaning that you will have a favorable death, that you will have died a good death. That you will have nothing to fear. You will not have to be apprehensive about what awaits you after this point. May Allah make us from those people. So we mentioned that the scholars have elaborated in, in great detail from the earliest generations of Islam based upon what is in the Quran and the Sunnah expressed in so many ways and explained in so much detail I and mean, that we can only, as the author says here in this book, 
Hafidh al-Hakami rahimahullah ta'ala he says here in this book that we have in our hands and he, that it is what we can mention is but a drop in the ocean and how could that not be the case when we're talking about a statement of belief that everything in Islam all of its beliefs and all of its laws are built upon it is a foundation of all of those things without it all of that collapses and is meaningless it is the reason for our existence it is why we were brought into life to understand that la ilaha illallah to understand that la ilaha illallah and so this statement la ilaha illallah has shurut and the scholars explain any what are called the usul of iman or the usul of iman as we mentioned a number of times before but it never hurts to reinforce that the core of faith is two things the core of faith is two things and another way to say the core of faith is the bare minimum that a person must have to be a muslim it's two things and it is belief and compliance we've heard this in so many different ways in the book winning the war within again in the book fleeing to allah the statements of ibn qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala about the reality of the heart and about the state of the nafs the soul and about building and fortifying ourselves with good character and virtue and so on and so forth we heard it over and over again that everything in islam is one of two things it is either information or laws information or laws allah is telling us something or the prophet is telling us something informing us of something and so what allah has informed us of And what the Prophet has informed us of has been explained in detail with logical evidence. The belief in La ilaha illallah, the belief in Muhammad Rasulullah, the belief in the Day of Judgment, etc., is pre- and it is presented in the Quran in such a way that it is reinforced and proven with simple, rational, logical arguments beyond a shadow of a doubt. So it's not something that we're just told to believe, but it's something that is proven to us so that we can have conviction and certainty. And this is something that we covered in the first couple of classes on this book. And so it is either information or it is laws. Information must be known with certainty and accepted. It must be known with certainty and accepted. So these are three conditions of la ilaha illallah, right? One word for that is at tasdiq. At tasdiq. Affirmation. Belief. To believe. So what is called the statement of the heart, the knowledge of the heart, the understanding of the heart, the tasawwur, the scars they say, the tasawwur, the conceptualization of the heart, the heart's ability to know right from wrong and distinguish right from wrong, connected to knowledge. What is found in the Quran and what is found in the Sunnah of information must be met with and responded to with tasdeeq. Tasdeeq. Tasdeeq from the word sidq. It's truthfulness, to believe in the truthfulness of something. You must affirm something as being the truth. You must affirm the trueness of a thing, of everything. If a person was to say about anything that is in the Quran or anything in the Sunnah, just as a blanket statement, you tell them something about the affairs of the unseen that is authentic from the Prophet wasallam or that is explicitly mentioned in the Qur'an, I don't believe that. That person is no longer a Muslim. 
that person is no longer Muslim. Because if you disbelieve in one thing in Islam, while knowing that it is from Allah or from the Prophet wasallam, it is like you have disbelieved in all of Islam because the same rule that you have within you and the same mindset that you have within you that allowed you to reject one thing would allow you to reject anything based on your whims and based on what you pick and choose to be your religion. So you have not submitted to Allah and you have made takdeeb. And takdeeb is the asal of kufr. It's the opposite of tasdeeq. You have made takdeeb from the word kadib. You have said something that Allah, you have accused Allah of being a liar. And accused the Prophet of being a liar. If Allah says something, you said that's not true. If your parents said something to you and they told you something was a fact, they gave you the facts as they know them. And you say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. It's just something that you know that they know firsthand. And you have accused them of intentionally or unintentionally being untruthful. But no matter how you twist and turn it, so on and so forth, that's the case with a human being. What about Allah? If you believe at the core of belief, so Allah knows everything. There's nothing of knowledge that is hidden to Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala, Allah is the source of all knowledge. And you say about something that Allah said, or the most knowledge of a human being that Allah created, being the Prophet said something and you said that that's not true, then you have disbelieved. And what you have disbelieved in, like the Salaf said about the Qadr, مثلاً, they said, Al-Qadaru nidham al-Tawheed. Al-Qadr, which is one of the six pillars of faith. Nidham al tawheed It is the nidham of tawheed. It is the structure that connects all of tawheed together. Al-Qadr, because belief in the Qadr is to believe in Allah's knowledge, His power, His wisdom, and His will. Tabarak wa ta'ala, and that is at the core of His rubiyah and the, of His lordship and His control over all things and His creating all things, as at the core of His names and His attributes and why we worship Him. So the Salaf they said, some of the earliest Salaf they said, Al Qadr Nidham al Tawheed. That Qadr is the Nidham of Tawheed, it is what holds Tawheed together. A person's worship of Allah together, singing out Allah with his rights together. Faman Wahad Allah wa Kaddaba bil Qadr. So whoever says, says that there is one God and that is Allah wa Kaddaba bil Qadr, but they reject the Qadr. But they reject the qadr, naqadha takdibuhu tasdiqahu. Naqadha takdibuhu tasdiqahu. Then what he has negated, what he has disbelieved in, has invalidated what he has believed in. Similarly, if a person was to say that they believe in Allah and that Allah has a right to be worshipped, and then they make shirk with Allah. Ta'ala, then that simple act of shirk that they did, a singular act of shirk, could invalidate their entirety, the entirety of their worship of Allah is rendered null and void. So the religion is belief and laws. Beliefs have to be responded to with belief. Beliefs have to be responded to with belief. You have to believe, you have to believe in beliefs. Anything of knowledge and information that has come from Allah and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has to be believed. It has to be believed. It has to be affirmed. And laws are how a person ought to be. What is required from us? What is required from us? That is the laws of Islam, the rights of Allah, and the rights of people. How we are supposed to act. That is what laws are. And laws must be responded to with inqiyad, the action of the heart that results in the action of the body, which is inqiyad, compliance. Compliance. So the entirety of Islam, the Salaf explained in great detail, is tasdiq and inqiyad, belief and compliance. Belief and compliance over and over again in the writings of the earliest scholars of Islam, in refuting the Jahmiyyah, and refuting the Murji, and refuting the deviant sects who negated 
the reality of faith. And they said that faith is just that you believe. Some of them have said faith is just that you know. Something is the truth. Well, Iblis knew that Allah was omnipotent and powerful, but he still is Iblis. So it's not enough for a person to just know to be a believer. Allah said in the Quran, وَجَهَدُوا بِهَا وَاسْتَيْقَنَتَا أَنفُسُهُمْ ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوًّا جَهَدُوا بِهَا That they rejected what the messengers came with. وَاسْتَيْقَنَتَا أَنفُسُهُمْ Although they had certainty within their souls, in their heart of hearts, they knew for a certainty that the prophets and the messengers were speaking the truth and were in fact messengers from Allah. But they only did so ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوًّا ظُلْمًا وَعُلُوًّا Out of oppressiveness, out of the wrongness of their souls and out of arrogance. And out of arrogance. So it's not enough that a person just has one without the other. That they believe and that they know without complying. Without complying. As we mentioned last week, compliance is on different levels. And all of the things connected to the conditions of La ilaha and Allah, they're on different levels. Knowledge, فَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ Allah says in the Quran, above everybody with knowledge is somebody who knows more. Up until the highest of the scholars, from the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, from the small student of knowledge, are people who know more than him, and people who know more than him, up until the greatest scholars, and every time up until the most knowledgeable scholars from the companions, and then the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then Jibreel, and then Allah, etc., right? So there's no one who knows what Allah knows. But there's always somebody who knows more. So the point here being that knowledge is mutafawit, it's on different levels. And the more you have of knowledge, and what comes paired with knowledge, which is certainty, then the stronger your faith is going to be, inshallah ta'ala. And it's not about how much you know, but it's about how well you know what you know and how much it has had the effect of the other things that we'll come to see. So we mentioned the conditions of La ilaha illallah in some detail. And we have arrived towards the end of those conditions now. So we mentioned connected to tasdeeq, belief, you have knowledge and certainty. Knowledge and certainty. Knowing what La ilaha illallah means, what you are negating, what you are affirming. Certainty about it. And we mentioned that in some detail. We're not going to recap it now. And we mentioned a third condition. And this is the order that is given by Hafiz al-Hakami, rahimahullah ta'ala. And his order is wajih. And his order, the sequence that he brings these conditions in, is an important sequence. Because they are mentioned in different order by some of the scholars. All of the scholars, they start with knowledge and certainty. All of the scholars start with knowledge and certainty. But then what comes after that? And he, there's no particular order that is given by most of the scholars. The order that he gives is probably the best order. So knowledge, certainty, and acceptance. And acceptance. And we said another word for acceptance, qabool. Al-ilmu, al-yaqinu, wal qabool. For acceptance is, and in qabool, acceptance is receptiveness. How receptive you are to Islam meaning your raghbah, and how much you are interested, your degree of interest in Islam. Your qabool, with the meaning of iqbal. Iqbal, the word iqbal means to face something. Like the word qibla means the direction that you face. Iqbal, right? Iqbal qabool, and he is acceptance, that you accept something. And in your degree of acceptance of something is your focus upon that thing, and you're turning towards that thing, and your interest and that thing as opposed to your, as opposed to a person being disinterested in the thing. So now a person knows, and a person, they have certainty of what they know, and they accept it. And they accept it. Al-ilmu wal-yaqeenu wal qabun And now they have accepted it as being the truth, and they are receptive to it, and they are interested in it more than anything else. Then they... Make inqiyad. Another word for inqiyad, compliance, in Arabic is Islam. Is Islam. Just like another word for at tasdiq ma'al iqrar, at tasdiq with iqrar. Iqrar is another word for qabul, for acceptance. 
Tasdik and Iqrar together is the meaning of Iman. So now you have Iman and you have Islam together. Right? Al-ilm, al-yaqeen, al-qabool, that's Iman. And you have Al-inqiyad, which is Islam. You're surrendering, you're submitting, you're compliance. And compliance is on many different levels. And the scholars differ over what is the bare minimum level of compliance. And there is strong evidence to say that their bare minimum level of compliance outside of believing that what is halal is halal and what is haram is haram to the extent of what reaches you of knowledge, even if you fall short in doing it. A person believes that the halal is a halal, the haram is a haram. If they believe the halal is a halal and the haram is haram, and then out of weakness they fall into the haram, then they're still a Muslim. Why? Because they still believe. They still believe and they still comply at the core of compliance. It's just that everybody has shortcomings and and there is no person except that they will fall into forbidden acts. And they will fall into sins. And that's not to diminish any of the uh, harm of sin and disobedience, but it's just a fact. It's a statement of fact. The best of those who make a lot of mistakes are those who make a lot of toba. And those who repent frequently. But outside of that, because that's the basic definition the scars give. And that goes back to the first thing that we mentioned, which is tasdeep. That you say that what is halal is halal, what is haram is haram. The person was to say, make halal something made halal, uh, made haram rather, or make haram something Allah made halal. And that person has make takdeep. They have disbelieved in what Allah revealed to the Prophet wasallam By making something impermissible that Allah permitted or something permissible that Allah made impermissible. But they say generally outside of that, the scholars differ, and there's valid differing between the scholars based upon reading of certain hadith that are all authentic. They say, many of them, they say that the bare minimum of what a person must do after uttering the shahadatain is to pray five times a day. And the person who abandons the salah has left from Islam. Others from the scholars, they say that the person who abandons the salah is a criminal and his crime is worse than fornication and alcoholism and drug abuse and homosexuality, etc. However, he is still within the fold of Islam. He is still within the fold of Islam and there is proof and evidence for both of those arguments. And for that reason, it's not a matter of aqidah, it's not a matter of belief that if somebody takes one view or another, that you say that person has deviated or this person has deviated because there is room for interpretation of the text. But the point there being, the scholars, as Ibn Qayyim in his book about the Salat and the ruling of the person who abandons the Salat, he said the scholars have never differed in the past or at present that the person who abandons the Salat is a criminal and that his crime is worse than murder and worse than fornication and homosexuality and being a drunkard and etc. Right? But they... And they don't differ over the person who abandons the salat and persists upon not praying that he is to be dealt with by the Muslim authority and threatened with capital punishment. And as Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymi rahimahullah ta'ala said, لا يتصور It's unimaginable that a person will be taken as a prisoner, put in prison, threatened with capital punishment, with execution, and then would rather die than pray that that person without a doubt who, <laughs> that that person is a kafir. If you would rather die than pray, right? Then obviously you're not a Muslim, right? If you hate the Salat that bad that you would rather die than pray, then you're not a Muslim. And so the level of inqiyad, the point being here is that inqiyad and his mutafawit, just like we say iman increases and decreases it, Increases with obedience, decreases with disobedience. Meaning it increases according to your level of inqiyad, your level of compliance. And it decreases with disobedience. And it decreases with disobedience. So inqiyad is the third condition, fourth condition. Al-ilm, al-yaqeen, al-qabool, al-inqiyad. The next condition is what we arrive at today. The fifth condition on page number 25 on the PDF. He says, Al-Khamisu 
Actually, we read this last week. Sincerity is a fifth condition. Sincerity is a fifth condition. So a person complies by worshipping Allah and not worshipping anything besides Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. And acts of obedience are the hukuk of iman. They are what are called the rights and the duties of faith. So his level of compliance is according to how obedient he is, how obedient he is, but the core obedience is that he worships Allah and doesn't worship anything besides Allah. So now he knows and he is certain and he accepts and he complies by worshiping Allah and leaving off anything else as worship besides Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. And then he does that with this fifth condition. With this fifth condition. So in Qiyad, everything else mentioned along with in Qiyad, generally everything that else that is mentioned after the first three conditions all go back to a single concept, which is submission. Which is that fourth thing that we just heard, submission or compliance in Qiyad or Islam or Al-Ist Islam. They're all words that are pretty much mean the same thing. The fifth condition is sincerity. It's sincerity. That a person submits with sincerity. And so sincerity is a description of the submission. Sincerity is a description of how they submit. How they submit. Al-Khamisu ikhlasu deeni lillahi azza wa jal al-munafi lil-shirk alladhi la yuqbalu ma'ah. The fifth condition is the sincerity of the religion for Allah, which is contrary to polytheism, that is not accepted alongside it. We read this last week. We go back to the recording. It's on the um, speaker for the masjid. The sixth condition, as-sidqu al-munafi al-kadib, is truthfulness. Al-munafi al-kadib, which is contrary to lying. That a person, when they utter this statement, they do so truthfully. And as we mentioned, each of these conditions that have been outlined by the scholars, the first of them to enumerate them in this way, in this detail, was the grandson of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, whose name is Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. Abdul Rahman ibn Hassan al Shaykh in his writings. And each of the scholars, when they mention these seven conditions, they bring. Um, a proof from the Quran and a proof from the Sunnah, although there are many, many proofs for them. They suffice with one verse and one hadith, that sort of thing, to prove their point. He said, He says, which is contrary to lying and it requires the heart and the tongue and the tongue to agree. For the heart and the tongue to agree. So this is A person's uh, manifestation of the statement, any that they are hourly professing the statement at this point, saying La ilaha illallah, that when they say this statement, that they are truthful in what they are saying, as opposed to the person who says this with their tongue, but their heart doesn't believe it. As opposed to the person who says this with their tongue, but their heart doesn't believe it. The person who conceals disbelief, but he portrays belief. And he inside is a disbeliever. But on the outside, he portrays himself as a believer. He's called a what? In the Quran and Sunnah. He's called a what? He's called a munafiq. He's called a munafiq. A munafiq, as was stated by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab himself, rahimullah ta'ala, in some of his writings, is of different categories. And it all goes back to three things that are going to sound familiar when you hear them, inshallah ta'ala. It goes back to takdeeb, a disbelief, and some or all of the religion, or hatred for some or, some or all of the religion, or disliking that the religion would be victorious and loving that the religion and the people of the religion would be humiliated and defeated. That is what major nifaq is. These are six categories the scholars say. Takdeeb al-Rasul aw ba'di ma ja'a bihi rasul is to reject the Prophet or reject some of what he came with. That's two categories. 
to reject the Prophet entirely or partially. It's major nifaq, it's major kufr, it's called nifaq and aqeedah, nifaq and i'tiqadi, mukhrij min al millah. Or, burgh the rasul, or burgh the ba'di ma ja'a bihi al rasul. Or, secondly, or uh, second pair of two, this would be three and four. Or, hating the Prophet, or hating anything that he came with. Or, hating anything that he came with. And as we'll hear in the next condition, the last condition is love. It's a condition of the shahada that you love. Islam and the people of Islam, that you love the laws of Islam, that you love Islam. If a person hates anything in Islam, now they dislike doing it because it's inconvenient for them or they're lazy, but they actually hate it. If a person hates anything, and including hatred is mocking, if a person mocks, disrespects, dislikes anything in Islam, then they are not a Muslim. They are not a Muslim. Burdur Rasul, hating the messenger. Or hating anything that he came with, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Hating anything in Islam. Then the last set of two. Which are five and six. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Three sets of two. Aw karahiyya tu intisar din rasul Or hating that the religion of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, would be victorious in the earth. Or what is similar to that? Being pleased that the religion of the Prophet should be weak in the earth. So it's kind of saying the same thing, but just in two different ways. And they're not exactly the same thing, but they are going in the same direction. Hating that the religion of the Prophet, that Islam would be victorious in the earth, or loving that Islam would be weak in the earth. When we look at the Quran, when we look at the statement of the Prophet, and we look at the seer of the life of the Prophet, and his dealing with the munafiqun, then all of nifaq goes back to these categories. And all of them are built upon usin wahid, upon one single thing that is the most immoral thing that a person can do, that is antithetical to Islam, that is very harmful and destructive to his Islam. And that puts his Islam at risk, which is al kadib which is lying and falsehood. Which is lying and falsehood. And so, as sidq al munafil al kadib So we have narrations from the Prophet and from the Sahaba. When it was said that the mu'min is possible, the believer or the Muslim can have any trait of bad character. They could be a coward. They could be stingy, they could be abusive, they could be oppressive, etc. It's possible that a person can be a believer and be fatally flawed like that, have these nasty aspects in their character. As Ibn Taymiyyah said, that the nafs of the person, the ego and the self of the person is like a sewer. It's like a sewer. And your job individually is not to dig out all the filth in the sewer. He said, because if you were to try to dig out Everything from the carcasses of dead animals and fecal matter and the filth that is inside of the sewer, you would never get to the bottom. As much as you dig out, the more will come out. But your job is to put the lid over it. Your job is to put the lid over it. So everybody has these nasty characteristics, some nasty characteristic about their self that they are trying to keep the lid on the sewer from, so it doesn't spill out into their behavior. Right? Put the lid on the sewer by busying their self with good, busying their minds with good, occupying their bodies with good, so on and so forth, sufficing their self with what is halal, what is from what is haram, trying to make those liabilities and the assets. And it is possible that a person can take some bad characteristics and make them into good characteristics. Some people are jerks and they're cold and they don't care about other people, so on and so forth. If they can take that redirect that audacity and that coldness into bravery for the religion, something that helps the religion and the people of the religion, then it becomes an asset, not liability, that sort of thing. But there is one characteristic, and we can add a second characteristic to it that is mentioned in some reports, 
that is the most antithetical thing to a person's Islam because it goes against his belief and his compliance. It goes against truth and justice because all of Islam is truth and justice. If Islam is information and laws, then all of the information is truth and all of the laws is all of the laws are just. And that information that is true must be truthfully conveyed. And those laws that are just must be complied with, as we heard. And there are two things that go against that, against that that are the most destructive things that a person can have that are mentioned over and over again throughout the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and in different ways throughout the Qur'an. And they are lying and treachery. Lying and treachery. Lying is al-ikhbar bi khilaf al waqi Is that a person informs, says something that is contrary to reality. So the person who makes it their habit to be able to move their tongue with lies and spread lies, then eventually it may pour over into things that are even greater than 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 uh, more insignificant things, right? And a person may tell uh, what are deemed to be small lies or harmless lies in their perception and that sort of thing. And then that habit of lying and getting away with lying and being able to gaslight people and all those sorts of things becomes oppression. Now you see that the way to get what you want as you get older is to be cutthroat and to lie and to cheat and to swindle and so on and so forth and to pull the wool over the eyes of the people. So now you go from something that is personally harmful to you that makes you an awful person because you're a liar to something that is oppressive to other people. And then what is worse than that is the highest level of oppression, which is lying on Allah or lying on the Prophet wasallam. Speaking about Allah without knowledge, speaking about Islam without knowledge is al kadhib on Allah. Every type of innovation, every type of ta'wil and batil, every type of misportrayal of Islam or talking about Islam while you don't know what you're talking about is lying upon Allah is lying upon Allah. And so Al-Kadhib, I say all that to say that Al-Kadhib is the root of the tree of hypocrisy. Lying and dishonesty and treachery is the trunk and the roots of hypocrisy. Major hypocrisy and and minor hypocrisy. The Prophet said, Ayatul Munafiq, Salah. And in one wording, Arba. There are three, in one wording, four things. There are the description of the munafiq. Ida haddatha kadhib. When he speaks, he lies. tumina khan. And when he is entrusted with something, he is treacherous and betrays his trust. He doesn't fulfill people's rights that he has been entrusted with, that he is responsible for fulfilling. Wa wa'ada akhlaf. And when he makes a promise, he breaks his promise. And then the fourth is إِذَا خَاسَمَ فَجَرَ It's mentioned in a different hadith that mentions four. When he argues and disputes with other people, he does so in a wicked fashion. He behaves wickedly. Some people, they fall into what is called the confidence trap. Some people, they get away with what they get away with by being the loudest, wrongest person in the room. Right? Just being able to outspeak other people. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا أَنَا بَشَرٌ وَإِنَّمَا أَقْضِي بِنَحْوِ مِمَا أَسْمَعَ وَلَا عَلَى بَعْضَكُمْ أَلْحَنَ فِي حُجَّتِهِ مِنْ بَعْضٍ He said, I'm just a human being like you. And I can only judge in disputes based on what I hear. And it's possible that one of you may be able to phrase his argument stronger than the other. So whoever, قَضَيْتُ لَهُ Whoever I have given a decision to, in which he has taken the right of his brother, because his brother was able to argue his case better, and he takes that from his brother, and he has taken for himself a piece of hell. He has taken for himself a piece of the hellfire. The point here being, I mean, that there are people who are wrong, who are liars, who are treacherous, who are deceivers, who are, to the end of what is mentioned in these descriptions, who 
And he, when they argue with other people, they are criminal in their behavior. They are criminal in their behavior. This is how the people of Nifaq are. And they are the greatest threat to the Muslim community. They are the greatest threat in the Muslim community. Islam is built upon truthfulness and trustworthiness. And all the character of the Muslim is built upon that. And so Nifaq is what is being referred to here. And he, it is that a person utters the statement, La ilaha in Allah truthfully, which is contrary to him lying in what he is saying. And that's why some of the reports, they say that the person who is like that, then he has nifaqun, that he has nifaqun khalis, and he is a pure munafiq. Because a person, whenever he speaks, he lies. And whenever he is entrusted with something, he betrays his trust. Not just sometimes, or when he thinks he can get over on somebody, or is in a moment of weakness or something of the sort. And he, but whenever he is like that, that, that is how he is. And when he argues and disputes with others, that he behaves wickedly with them, and oppresses them, and so on and so forth, and he breaks his promises to the end of it, that the person who is like that is a pure munafiq. That that is from his outward behavior that shows that person is more than likely a pure munafiq. He is a pure munafiq. Why? Because a person who is like that, hal yutasawwar, can it be imagined about a person who is like that, annahu yakhafullah, wa ya'taqid annallaha yarahu wa yasma'u kalamahu wa yanduru ilayhi wa yuraqibuhu. Can you imagine a person who really believes that Allah knows everything? That Allah is listening to everything and watching everything and observing everything and a witness to everything. And that Allah Ta'ala sees everything. And that Allah never forgets anything. And that Allah will hold the person accountable for what he says and does, and so on and so forth. It could be imagined about a person who without any shame, without any shyness, and he conducts himself in this fashion that they are a believer. This person they have exhibited goodness by saying that they are a believer, and they have concealed evil. And they have concealed evil. That's the reality of nifaq. Nifaq, another word for nifaq, or kathib, which is the opposite of a sidq. A sidq is on many different levels in Islam. The whole religion is sidq. All the religion is truthfulness. Another word that you could say is trueness. Another word you could say there is authenticity. Be an authentic, genuine Muslim as opposed to a lying, disingenuous person who claims to be a Muslim. And so disingenuousness, and the genuineness, sometimes a sidq, and it manifests itself in the hal of a person, the determination of a person, the vigor of a person, the excitement of a person, how much a person is excited about Islam, which goes back to what we mentioned before, their receptiveness of Islam, their interest in Islam. That's why Allah Ta'ala, He described the munafiqun, how He described them in His book, that they are lazy when they go to the salat. They are lazy when it comes to the salat. And they are stingy when it comes to spending their money. And they're stingy, they don't give and they tell others not to give. And they make fun of people who give in charity, who give small amounts in charity. And they say, and he, they make any limbs of those people. Say, Allah doesn't need your charity. Allah doesn't need that $5 you gave or that $20 that you gave. And he, that's something that Allah is greater than needing. Allah, of course, doesn't need anything from anybody. And he, but to mock the believers and to be in a condition where you have no azima, you have no determination and no vigor. And he is indicative of nifaq. That you are not on the inside, which you portray yourself to be on the outside. And every person should be afraid of that. Every person should be afraid that there is a disconnect between what they say and what they know and what they do. There should be a dissonance. A person should know. Because as the imams of the salaf highlighted, That all of the Salaf, all of the Sahaba, fear Nifaq for themselves. They feared hypocrisy for themselves. 
They felt like there was a disconnect there. They didn't doubt whether or not they believed in Allah, but they doubted their level of sincerity and genuineness. And they feared falling into disbelief. They know that Islam isn't something that was that is their right, but it is a gift from Allah. Tabarak wa ta'ala. And that just as Allah has given it to you, you may do some things to bring about the punishment of Allah and Allah causing you to stray and die upon something other than Islam or something other than righteousness or to die in a bad state. He says, and so what it is is that a person's heart and tongue utter the statement together. He mentions the statement of Allah, Tabarak wa ta'ana, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu taqullaha wa kunu ma'a sadiqeen. O you who believe, have taqwa of Allah, fear Allah, and be with the sadiqeen, and be with those who are true. So it is not just truthfulness, it is trueness. The sadiqeen are the people of trueness, are the real people, the true believers. وَقَالَ تَعَانَا فِي كَشْفِ مَا أَضْمَرُهُ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَحَدْكِ أَسْتَارِهِمْ حَيْثُ أَذْهَرُ الْإِسْلَامِ وَأَبْتَنُ الْكُفْرِ He says, likewise, Allah, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, revealed the hidden intentions of the hypocrites, exposing their deception, where they outwardly showed Islam, but inwardly harbored disbelief. He said, Tabarak wa Ta'ala, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ from the people are those who say we have believed in Allah, we have believed in the final day and the day of judgment. However, they are not believers. And they wish to deceive Allah. They try to deceive Allah and those who believe, but they deceive only themselves and realize it not. They scheme and they plot and they think that they're fooling Allah. And they think that they're fooling the believers. But in reality, they have deceived no, nobody but themselves. They are trying to deceive Allah and they are deceiving the believers. However, they are really, in fact, only deceiving their own selves. وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ Without even realizing. فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ مَرَضٌ فَزَادُهُمَ اللَّهُ مَرَضًا وَلَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْذِبُونَ and they have in their hearts a disease, and so Allah has only increased their disease. And they will have a painful punishment for what they habitually used to do, and for the lies. Because of the lies that they used to tell, because of their kithib. Because they are people who are dishonest and people who are liars. Lies in their, liars in their claim to faith, yani not practicing what they claim. And to the end of what could be said here. فَزَادَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ مَرَضًا وَأَنَّهَا لَمْ تُوَاطِئُ أَلْسِينَتَهُمْ فَهُمْ أَشَرُّ مِنَ الْكُفَّارِ Hafiz al-Hakimi rahimullah ta'ani says that Allah has increased the disease in their hearts because it did not agree with their tongues. It, meaning their faith and their claim, did not agree uh, or their hearts did not agree with their tongues. And what was in their hearts did not match. It's a better translation here. What was in their tongues, what was upon their tongues. فَهُمْ أَشَرُّ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ Making them worse and more, and more evil than the kufar. Making them worse. They are kufar, but they are worse than the people who are worthy. And they are kufar. And because they pretend to be Muslims. فَزَادَ اللَّهُ قُلُوبَهُمْ مَرَضًا وَأَنَّهَا لَمْ تُوَاطِعَ الْسِينَتَهُمْ فَهُمْ أَشَرُّ مِنَ الْكُفَارِ وَمَأْوَاهُمْ الدَّرْكُ الْأَسْفَلُ مِنَ النَّارِ And their final abode will be the lowest place of the hellfire for that reason, lower than the rest of the kufar. وَقَدْ بَيَّنَ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ فِي سُورَةِ التَّوْبَةِ كَثِيرًا مِنْ فَضَائِهِهِمْ بِقَوْلِهِ تَعَالَى وَمِنْهُمْ وَمِنْهُمْ وَكَادَ فِي سُورَةِ النِّسَاءِ إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ وَإِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ أي سورة المنافقين وغيرها يشهد سبحانه وتعالى أنهم لكاذبون So this is what we find mentioned over and over again in different ways. In the three places in the Quran, I take note of them, they're mentioned here, where Allah describes the munafiqun as they were in real life, in real time, 
during the life of the Prophet and his interaction with them in three places in the Quran. In three places in the Quran. And Surah Al Tawbah, which is called Surah Al Fadiha by Ibn Abbas, he said, Surah Al Tawbah is Surah Al Fadiha. Fadiha, it is the Surah that exposes, meaning that Allah, all throughout Surah Al Tawbah, over and over again mentions the descriptions of the munafiqun and that they not that they are not as they seem. They are not as they put themselves out to be. That they are plotting and scheming and they are deceiving the believers and they are working for the downfall of Islam while behind closed doors killing the morale of the believers, plotting, stealing, and cheating, and so on and so forth. So Allah and Surah to Al At Tawbah, Surah to Tawbah 1. The second place is Surah to Nisa. Surah to Nisa has the second longest groupings of verses or numbers of verses where Allah talks about the Munafiqun, where Allah talks about the hypocrites. And the third is the most obvious one, which is Surah to Munafiqun, the Surah that is named after the hypocrites. So these three places, the first being the longest, most detailed description of Munafiqun and Surah Al-Tawbah, the second being a Surah Al-Nisa, and the third being a Surah Al-Munafiqun. Allah describes them and Allah bears witness that they are Kathibun. In many places in those surahs, Allah exposes their lies, exposes their dishonesty, exposes their reality, and shows that they are liars. وَفِي حَدِيثِ مُعَاذِ بن جَبَلْ رضي الله عنه عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ما من أحد يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله صدقا من قلبه إلا حرمه الله على النار متفق عليه. Likewise in a hadith of Mu'adh, we're on page 29, in a hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal رضي الله عنه from the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he said there are none who bear witness that La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah Siddiqan min qalbihi Truthfully from the heart Truthfully from the heart So there's another evidence here There are many evidences in those three surahs that we mentioned Allah exposes in many different ways the reality that they are people of falsehood People of lies And here in this verse the Prophet says it explicitly and he, there is none who bear witness, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, Siddiqan min qalbihi, truthfully from their heart. Illa harramahu Allahu ala nar. Except that Allah will forbid that person from the fire. May Allah make us from them. Except that Allah forbids him to the fire. Allah makes him haram for the fire. This hadith is agreed upon being as in Bukhari and Muslim. Wa fi hadith an Arabi, al ladhi jaa ila nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yas'alu, an arkan al Islam, al ladhi a'adamuha. هذه الكلمة لما أخبره النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بذلك قال هل علي غيرها قال لا إلا أنت توع قال والله لا أزيد عليها ولا أنقص فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم أفلح إن صدق Likewise in the hadith of the Bedouin who came to the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم asking about the pillars of Islam the greatest which is his statement, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, when the Prophet Sallallahu had informed them, had informed him about the pillars of Islam, he says, is there anything else that I should do? Meaning, is there anything else I have to do as mandatory for me to do? Outside of these five pillars, is there anything else as mandatory for me to do? Is there anything else as mandatory that I have to do outside of these five pillars? And all of Islam is built upon these five pillars. The pillars of Iman, are all built upon the belief in Allah, which is a shahada in la ilaha Allah. So the pillars of Iman are found inside the pillars of Islam. Is there anything else I have to do? Is there anything else binding upon me? The Prophet he said, no, unless you do voluntary deeds. You can do more. A person who does what is mandatory and then excels and does what is recommended, gets close to Allah and becomes the wani of Allah, the ally of Allah, the friend of Allah, the loved one of Allah. This comes authentically in the one on hadith that's called Hadith al-Wali, Hadith of the Allies of Allah. 
He said, unless you want to do what is voluntary. He said, wallahi. He said, by Allah, I will never increase or decrease upon this. I will never do more or less. I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to do the five pillars of Islam. I'm just going to do the five pillars of Islam. And believe in the shahadatain, right? I'm believing the shahadatain and do the five pillars of Islam. The Prophet Sallallahu he said, Sadaqa in uh, aflah in sadaq, aflah in sadaq. That he is aflah, he is successful if he is truthful. If he is truthful. And so here the Prophet ﷺ mentioned as a condition, if he is truthful in what he is saying, meaning that his heart is actually in it, his heart is actually in it, then he will be successful. That's why a siddiq has been mentioned by the scholars as a third condition for deeds, along with, what are the other two? Sincerity and following the sunnah. They say siddiq, shartun thalith, is a third condition. They said, وَلَكِنَّهُ لَيْسَ شَرْطَ الْقَبُورِ هُوَ شَرْطُ الصُّدُورِ أي صدور العمل They said, it's not a condition of the action being accepted. It is a condition of the action happening to begin with. And they say, because صدق, what we say here is truthfulness or trueness, genuineness, and he is something that is in a person's behavior. It is in a person's zeal, as we heard before. This is all implied. It is a state of being. There's authenticity as a state of being, trueness as a state of being. And Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah ta'ala, he highlights this in great detail throughout his writings, and he gives a really uh, humorous and beneficial metaphor. He says that you have three conditions, right? You have three conditions. You have, when you're on a journey, we actually covered this and fleeing to Allah and brought the statement of Ibn Qayyim, some of his statements about this. You have the path, which is Islam and the Sunnah, following the Sunnah. It's one condition. You have the destination of the path, which is Allah, that you're doing what you're doing to reach Allah, sincerely for the sake of Allah. So now you have the destination and you have the path. What do you have to do? You have to progress along the path. What caused you to progress is this, is siddh, is trueness and genuineness. He said the person who has sincerity and knows the truth and loves the truth, so they know the truth and they love the truth, embrace the truth, sincere for the truth, so on and so forth, but they don't have determination and zeal and this trueness that we're talking about here. He said it would be like a person who is trying to walk while in shackles. So his hands are shackled and his feet are shackled, right? Imagine you trying to go on a journey while you, you know, have however many links in a chain between your feet to be able to scoot one foot to another. He said the person who lacks this trueness, who has a weakness in this trueness, because if you lack it all together, that's a whole different thing, but who has a weakness in this trueness, a khala, a deficiency in it, they're going to be like the person who's mukabba, like the person who was shackled, trying to scoot, right? Trying to scoot along the path. He said, or oh, like a person trying to walk in his iliatehi, and his two uh, uh, things that are on the top of his legs, his, his buttocks, right? Person who is, not, instead of walking on his feet to get along the path, he's scooting, right? He's scooting like this on his backside. He said, this is what will happen if a person doesn't have this matter of a siddh, which is determination, trueness, veracity, that you put your best foot forward. And he describes it with two beautiful descriptions that are very important that make a person a strong believer. And he describes it as follows. He says, it comprises of two things. The first is, Adam al التفات. Is that the person does not allow their self to be distracted by harmful things. They don't allow their self to be distracted by harmful things. And the second is Badlul Majhud Fisai, is that they give their best effort, that they give their best effort in moving forward. A person who does this will 
progress exponentially in faith and he will be spared and free from nifaq and in his minor forms and his major forms and the major forms and the minor forms that which removes him from Islam and that which threatens to lead to that which will remove him from Islam he will meet Allah wa huwa anhu rad and he will meet Allah wa Allah is pleased with him we ask Allah tabarak wa ta'ala and yaghfir lana wa yafu anna and to forgive us and to pardon us hadha wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa sallam wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam there's one more sentence we'll just read it really quick fasharata fi falahi an yakuna sadiqan so here the Prophet Sallallahu in this hadith that we heard, he stipulated the condition of his success as being truthful. For him to succeed, he has to be truthful. فَخَرَجَ بِذَارِكَ الْكَاذِبُ الْمُنَافِ فَإِنْهُ لَا فَلَحَ لَهُ أَبَدًا بَلْ لَهُ الْخَيْبَةُ وَالرَّدَى عِيَاذًا بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَانِكِ He says, uh, so this uh, exempts, ex- excludes the lying hypocrite, the fake, the person who is faking, and he, the, the, the poser, the person who is a lying hypocrite, who will never be successful, but rather is destined for disappointment and destruction and humiliation. He said, May Allah protect us from that. As we heard that all of the early scholars of Islam and righteous people of Islam feared and found for themselves. And we'll conclude here. Sa'ilin Allah tabarak wa ta'ala tawfiq wa sadad wa hidayah wa sallam 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 wa